From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Welcome to Newsmakers, I'm Tim White. On Thursday, I sat down with Governor Gina Raimondo in the state room of the Rhode Island State House. We covered a lot of ground from the reopening of schools to unemployment, even her reaction to the president's suggestion that the country delay its elections. Here now is my conversation with Governor Raimondo. Governor Raimondo, thank you very much for joining us, and it's good to see you again in person. Nice to see you. I haven't seen you in months. I know, no, it's good. I mean, just, you know, virtually, of course, but uh, we should point out we're eight feet apart in a room that's well ventilated. Um, (laughs) All right, I got to begin with schools. Yeah. That's the most important topic. Um, And there's a lot of hand wringing happening around kitchen tables across the state right now. What about, what about in your kitchen? As things stand, if it's an option in your household, do you and the first gentleman feel comfortable sending sending your kids back to school for full in-person learning? Yeah, I would say yes if the schools give us comfort that they have all the precautions in place and if by the end of August uh, the numbers are as they are now. So we are anxious to get our kids back to school, you know, and every parent is different, but our kids, like I think most kids, are missing out by not being in school. They are missing their friends, they're missing their teachers. Distance learning was good, and it was good for a while, but every kid is falling behind. So um, we want our kids in school. And I look at, I, here's how I think about it. There is no question children should be in school, they do better in school. The question is, how do we make it safe for them to do that? So as long as our, uh, the prevalence of the virus is low, as it is now, at least where it is now or lower. The prevalence of the virus town by town is low. It's very possible that, you know, Central Falls and Pawtucket aren't going to be ready to go back in person, but uh, other places are. And then we have to make sure we can do testing, testing turnaround times in a couple of days. It's a heavy lift. It's a heavy lift. But the bottom line is, yes, we'd like to get our kids back in school as long as we have confidence that it'll be safe. Why not buy a little more time? Massachusetts, as you know, pushed back the opening of school 10 days, going to a 170 day school year. If it's possible that you might do that, why not do it sooner rather than later so schools can plan? Is that on the table? It is on the table, but not as a primary option. Why not? I think it's giving you pause about that. Yeah, well, well, you know, so yesterday I spent all day a, a Zoom call with superintendents, a Zoom call with principals, and at the moment our thought is we'd be better off to start even gradually on August 31st or even in a hybrid than push it off. Kids have been out of school for a while now, so from what we're hearing, there's an anxiousness to go ahead and start the learning again. Uh, listen, if we get to the end of August and the cases are high or we feel like a couple more weeks would help us, we would push it back. Right now, it would be more likely that we would stick to the 31st but have like a, a phasing in, you know, start with the little kids back first and then phase it in. You said on Wednesday, and, and I should point out we're, we're talking on a Thursday morning, that students will have to wear um, mask in class. What happens if a student refuses to wear uh, a mask, possibly maybe because mom and dad uh, don't want them to. Uh, can the school send that student home? Yeah, we have, we're trying to figure that out. The honest answer is we are, yesterday we made the decision to say it's mandatory, so now we have to re- answer all these questions. Um, my approach would be ex- exactly as the approach that we have, which is make it easy, offer the child a mask if they forget a mask, kids that are developmentally unable to wear a mask or keep it on, we understand that. Um, We don't want to get into a mask shaming kind of a situation. So we have, but the short answer is we have to make that policy. I hope we don't get there. I mean, masks are, it's a fact. They really work. Teachers are asking us for their own safety. Could you please mandate for the children to have masks? And so I think it's, it's important that we do that. It sort of dovetails into the question about vaccines, though, doesn't it? What, you know, hopefully we see a vaccine down the road. You and I both know there are people out there that just will refuse to take that vaccine. Will you prohibit kids that don't 
take the vaccine because mom and dad don't want them to from going to our public yeah. schools. So another good question, then we're going to have to cross that bridge when we come to it. I will rely heavily, I'll do whatever the Department of Health says with respect to that. Um, and there's a lot, I'm not trying to dodge your question, but there's so many questions in that. The safety of the vaccine, the effectiveness of the vaccine. So I would truly rely on the public health experts to tell me what to do. And if they feel that it's a high risk to everybody else for that child to not be vaccinated, then yes, absolutely, it would be on the table to say you're not allowed to come back to school unless you're vaccinated. All right, uh, shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about back to work Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. um, you announced a $45 million job training program, and you're guaranteeing, watching your press conference on Wednesday, uh, you said, I believe, 3,000 jobs. So it's not just job training. You're saying, mm -hmm. at the end of the road, mm -hmm. 3,000 jobs uh, for Rhode Islanders once they go through that job training program. Just first, give people a sense of what, what kind of jobs are we talking about here? Yeah. So. The, you just put your finger on it. This isn't just job training. This is the promise of a job if you successfully complete the job training. So we went out and we found more than a dozen companies to promise us a certain number of jobs. So CVS said guaranteed 250 jobs initially. Uh, Electric Boat, I think 500 jobs initially. Infosys, 500 jobs initially. So it's different across the map, and we're gonna put this all up on our website. So for Infosys, I think it's data analysts and cybersecurity techs. For CVS, it'll be a combination of retail store jobs and pharmacy techs. Electric Boat, it's a combination of welders and um, uh, cybersecurity and IT. So it's, it, it's a matching function, but it's, I've learned you have to start with the employer. Otherwise, you run the risk of somebody getting the credential and there's, not, there's no job. So we're doing two, th th there's two things that make this different. One is there's the promise of a job because we started with the employers. Uh, Raytheon guaranteed, I think, 350 jobs. Those are mostly tech type jobs. Um, so you get the promise of a job. The other one is we're providing wraparound supports. So we've learned the number one reason people drop out of our existing job training programs is transportation. It's brutal. Really? They can't get a ride. So they want to do it. They want, they're smart. They're hungry for a new job. They're really capable. They can't show up reliably on time because they don't have a job to afford transportation, so they drop out. So we are providing financial coaching, job coaching, resume coaching, transportation to get to the job training, child care if you need to have someone watch your kid while you're in the job training. So uh, look, people are struggling. People are really A struggling. A lot of people are struggling, no, and I wonder if when uh, people are listening to you right now and they hear 3,000 jobs, that's great. But 350,000 people filed for unemployment claims, and what is the jobless number? 80 to 100,000 it waivers in there. Um, and some people might think, geez, that's just a, a drop, drop in mm -hmm, the bucket. Mm -hmm. It is, but it's also just the beginning. So the 45 million should allow us to find, train, and place closer to 7,000 people. Uh, right now, I have hard commitments from employers for about 3,500, so I've got to get, I have more work to do. Um, but hopefully this is a success and we keep it going. This is just right now, I need to get out there, it's immediate relief. We have about 115,000 people right now collecting unemployment insurance. Many of those people will go back to work. So what this program is about is really trying to target the people who, I'm, who might be long-term unemployed, like retail. Sadly, a lot of brick and mortar retail is just going to go out of business. And you've talked about this pandemic turbocharging, right? Yeah. I think that's the term you used. Yeah. Those. Uh, it's the trends that were already happening. You know, because of Amazon, because of technology, retail was slowly declining. Then Corona came, boof, lots of people out of work. Uh, hotels, many will not make it. As hard as we try, sadly, will not make it. So. Um, the whole trend towards folks without a degree past high school being left behind is just massively accelerated. So I think of it, um, the, the image I have in my mind that I, motivates me to work harder is like, imagine if you're a 49-year-old woman who's worked for 25 years uh, at 
Macy's or some other big retail store, you just have a high school degree, you've been piecing together a living with being a store clerk and maybe a waitress on the side. How do you feel now? How are you going, you know, I, I hope that woman or man, someone like that's listening to me. And I want you to go to Back to Work RI. There's a, hundreds of different kinds of jobs. Pick one, sign up for training. The training is free. And kind of get up the courage to find a new job because I would love for you to be able to work. Let's stick with unemployment, uh, Governor. I've, I've been spending a great deal of my time reporting over the last few months on unemployment DLT, helping people navigate uh, that. And it, it amazes me how I am still getting emails, and I'm talking thousands of emails from people who just, they just can't get through. They can't get through over to DLT. And look, it's not that they're not working hard over there. We, we know that they are working hard over there. It's just pure volume. We're six months in, it's the same story. You have used the National Guard uh, nursing homes. You use them to conduct tests. Secretary of State Gorbeo is asking them to help with, with elections. Ballots. Why not send some of them yeah. over to DLT to help answer phones? We've thought about this. First of all, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. It's not where it needs to be. I wish it were better. Um, it's cold comfort to know we're better than almost every other state. I mean, every state is struggling with this. The systems weren't built for this much volume. Now. Again, that's not comforting for folks out there. You know, we're better than Massachusetts. It's like, okay, where's my check? How could I, I hear that? Um, what we're, do it's not that easy. You need people who are trained. You need people who know how to do this. It's actually as much technology as it is people. So, you know, because you're saying it, I will go back. I will go back to the guard and press again on that issue. We've evaluated it in the past. Uh, we're getting better. I will say, I will push back a little. It is a whole lot better now than it was even a month ago, certainly than four months ago. But, but uh, we need to do better. We need to do better and we will. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about nursing homes, but from a budget perspective, since you've been governor, your budgets have repeatedly sought to squeeze nursing homes by holding down rate increases uh, for yeah. how much they can get paid by the state. Do you have any second thoughts on that now, knowing how badly they struggled during the pandemic? Uh, no, I don't. Nursing homes need to change the way they do business, and that's hard. Change is hard. The truth of it is our state probably needs fewer nursing homes and a whole lot more home care support. We have um, more than our fair share of beds. It's the most expensive way to take care of our seniors. And on the flip side, we don't do enough to help seniors age with dignity and health in their homes. So it's not that I've tried to squeeze nursing homes to squeeze nursing homes. It's that we're trying to tilt the whole system to have more resources to put in home care. Is that working though? Have you it seen is, that tilt? It's absolutely working. It, well, it's slow. It's slow. I wish, we, honestly, I wish we could turn a switch and tilt the system more quickly. But here's what I do know. COVID has put on full display how hard it is to control infections in a nursing home. No disrespect to anyone, these people are working their tail off. We have nursing homes with no private bathrooms. You know, you have a whole floor of people sharing a bathroom. Um, it's just harder, it's harder to control infections in a you know, dormitory style living. So if anything, it makes me move more urgently to home care and having the appropriate supports in home care because I think the, the data and the facts are clear that it's better for infection control and actually it's what folks want. So no, I don't have regrets. I have sympathy for what's going on in nursing homes, but I, we gotta keep moving to tilt the system towards home care. I wanna take a step back. Um, you know, we're sitting here at the end of July um, and I'm wondering if you could go back in time and talk to Gina Raimondo at the beginning of March uh, and, and tell her the number one thing you know now that you wish you knew at the beginning of March. What would it be? I wish I knew how bad it was going to be and how quickly it was going to be so bad. I would have said, Gina, shut it down now. Don't wait, don't wait a week. A week matters. Uh, don't wait two weeks. Uh, go faster to get your testing up and running. 
you know, I wish I knew then how robust of a testing infrastructure that we, the state, was going to have to set up ourselves. Um, gosh, I just, I didn't know then how bad it was going to be and how consuming it was going to be. You know, we've had to set up by ourselves, essentially, state by state, an entire infrastructure to deal with this. And, you know, we've done a pretty good job and I feel good about where we are, but if I knew in March, I would have just done more quicker. Preparing for this interview, I thought a little bit about Governor Garrahy and <laughs> the blizzard of 78 and the sweater and yeah. all that. And uh, yeah, I think your experience has been that on steroids of, of dealing with that nonstop. It's been sort of a blizzard that's been going on for six months. And I just, on a personal note, I wonder if you've run out of bandwidth and ha have you ever had a moment where you've just hit a wall? Often. Often. <laughs> yeah, often. You know, these have been, you work seven days a week. I took one Sunday off. You work seven days a week, you take the calls at one, two in the morning, you begin your day every day looking at the numbers. Uh, my job is to make it so that Rhode Island doesn't have to worry, right? Like you want your kids to be able to go back to school. You're a dad, you and your wife, you're worried. You sit around, you're worried. If I work a little harder, I want you to be less worried. I want you to say, we've got this, she's got this. She has a plan, it's gonna be safe, our kids can go to school or, or not. But so, it's, uh, it's a lot, you But know? so much it's is out of your control. You can sign all the executive orders that you want, but clearly from the tone of your press conferences, especially on Wednesday, yeah. you're frustrated. I am frustrated. I tell you, I just can't believe the selfishness of people. It is a fact. If we all wear masks, we save lives. So why don't you wear a mask? They're very cheap, it's very easy, it's so simple. I look, everybody forgets, I'm not saying that. But some people just refuse. I don't understand that selfishness. You know, someone said to me, it, well, it's like, it's like a bicycle helmet, on, excuse me, on a motorcycle. No, it's not, actually. If you don't wear a helmet, you're risking your own life. I think that's a bad move, but it's your own life. So if you want to stay home and not wear your mask, fine. But the minute you go out, and don't wear your mask, you're hurting everybody else. The minute you decide you're gonna have a 50 person pool party and not do contact tracing, it's like, come on people. Well, a thousand people have died. Can't you just have a 10 person party and keep it chill so we can save lives and get these kids back to school? So yeah, I'm a little frustrated. <laughs> I wonder if your sweater, by the way, is going to be the knock it off t-shirt. Possibly. That was hysterical <laughs> the way that took off. All right. I, I got to ask you about politics. Um, Can I, I just need to say one more thing. Go ahead. The most disturbing, concerning thing that I hear is, um, Gov, you did a good job with COVID. Yeah, as in past tense. Past tense. So you asked me hitting a wall. We, we are living this right now every day. Please stay vigilant. That's the hardest part for me, for us managing this crisis. It's kind of a slow grind crisis. It's a, this is a marathon of crisis. And we're, mm, I don't know, mile 12. We have a long way to go here. So I would ask Rhode Island, just take a breath. We're still in the soup. We're months to go before we're out of it. So please hang in there and be vigilant. Uh, you know, as hard as it is. It's not like a blizzard or a hurricane that's over in a few days. This is a long, slow burn. So Joe Biden yes. said he's going to announce his vice presidential pick next week. He is committed to um, picking a woman. Your name has surfaced in national news. I'm wondering if you've talked to Mr. Biden or has anyone in uh, his campaign reached out to you? Yeah, I haven't. And as I've said, I am so not focused on politics. Um, yesterday I spent 10 minutes on a Zoom fundraising phone call for Vice President Biden. Sounds like politics to me. But, you know, I was going to say 10 <laughs> minutes. It was a 10 minute Zoom call. It was the first thing I've done uh, because I'm so afraid uh, for the country if he doesn't get reelected. So I am going to do everything I can. But look, I'm here every day working here, not thinking politics, not engaged in that process. So. It, we're not going to hear your name next week is what you're saying. 
you would have to ask them that, but no. Okay. Um, all right. Well, look, what, and I know this is, we, I feel like we talked about this in, in, hypothetically in 2016 too, so let's, let's do it again four years later. If not vice president, what about, what if, you know, president-elect Biden, if he wins, comes to you and offers you a cabinet position? Would you consider it? Uh, no. I really wouldn't. Treasury Secretary, you would I, not consider that? It's, look, I, it, first of all, I truly spend no time thinking about this. So you're asking me and I'm reflecting. I was, I said no then, and I'm even less inclined now. I'm managing a 24-7 crisis with Rhode Islanders lives in the balance. So look, I will do whatever I need to do to get Joe Biden elected. I am a fan, a supporter. I think he's the right man for the moment to rebuild this country. But my 1,000% focus and attention is here to do my job. Governor, being governor is always an important job. It's never been more important than it is right now. I got a New York Times alert when waiting for you to come in here that the president had tweeted out that he's floating the idea of. I saw that. You saw that. Delaying the election. Delaying the election. It's insane. Like, he's insane. He has no authority to do that, as far as I know. Um, what does it say to you that he tweeted that out? He's losing his mind, you know? He's sending in federal agents into states for no apparent reason. You know, we've never seen a president do that, certainly not in our lifetimes. He's saying, uh, without sharing by what power, I'm just going to delay the election. So I think he's scared. I think he sees the polls. I think he feels his standing uh, dropping in the polls. And it's just a desperate attempt to try to delay the inevitable, which is him losing the election. Uh, so you know, I, I think it's crazy. The unrest in the country following the killing of George Floyd has put law enforcement under the microscope. Yeah. Many states are considering eliminating what's called qualified immunity, which protects police officers from, from civil suits. Would you sign a bill that got rid of qualified immunity for police? I'm very open to it. It's, I'm not going to say yes because it depends on what's in the bill. Right? This is a complicated issue, but I am very open to the discussion. And in fact, Colonel Manny is participating in that discussion. I think it's time for change. I will say this, that the Law Officers Bill of Rights in Rhode Island needs to be changed, needs to be Which reformed. Which is a different issue, of course, Fair than enough. qualified immunity. Fair enough, but yes, I, I think, here's what I think. I think we have to get more serious about finally addressing systemic racism in America, across the board, in housing, in education, in the economy, and in law enforcement. And so it's time to get really bold and put things on the table for discussion, like reparations, like qualified immunity, that have not before been on the table. So I'm open to the discussion, absolutely. I think it's good to have, and I think it's time for some big changes. Should Rhode Island state troopers wear body cameras? Uh, yes, and the colonel is in favor of that. It, it takes money, so we're trying to figure that out. Well, it could come from the federal government. That's it, been absolutely. Around. Yeah, I certainly don't oppose it. I would say yes. The colonel would say yes. We don't oppose it. I'd also say this, that, so yes, but sometimes I worry that people see body cameras as a panacea, silver bullet. You know, the Rhode Island State Police are incredibly well trained. They are professionals. They're trained in de-escalation. I'm not saying they're perfect. I'm not. My point is, there's as much to be said for training and a culture that doesn't abide racism. These things matter also, I think, almost just as much as body cameras. And you know I'm going to ask you the transparency question. Should body camera video be public record, considered yes. public record? Um, all right, we, we just have a couple of minutes left, so I want to hit up a few uh, fast ones here. And, um, Rhode Island, as you know, is one of two states, the other being Alabama, that requires two witnesses or a notary public to sign off in a mail ballot. A federal judge suspended those requirements for the upcoming election. But do you think it's time to sunset that requirement? That's a good question. Uh, maybe. I don't know. 
What, what gives you pause on that? Yeah, so I'm glad the court did what they did. And I was likely to do it myself as I did for the presidential primary. I was just thinking it through. But you didn't. I didn't. I was thinking about it. I was taking my time and then the court intervened and I'm happy with the decision. And we're going to help the Secretary of State um, to make sure we have f fair, smooth election. This is an important election. Um, look, I would say probably yes. Probably yes. I just think that there is some validity to the benefit of having the signature and a certain number of signatures. So I could see it both ways. Uh, I'm not opposed, but I also feel it's worth pondering a bit rather than rushing forward just to ask ourselves really what is in the best interest of balancing fraud with full accessibility to elections. So you said you had one Sunday off? Is that, is that what you so. said? Yeah. Have you gone to the beach yet? I have. I have you gone did. to the beach. <laughs> we do go to the beach. We, we go to the beach most weekends, late in the day. Uh, it's fine. It's fun. And I think my presence encourages I, I compliance. I wonder what that's like. When you're on the beach, do people, I mean, do people try and come up to you? and? Everyone's very respectful. People stay away. They say hello. The occasional selfie is taken six feet apart. Um, I, when people see me, they tend to follow the rules. <laughs> so, <laughs> mom's in the room. Yeah, know, exactly. You're, you're mom's in the room. If I take the kids to the pavilion for ice cream, we have our masks on. People see me, they scurry to get their mask. Oh, just, and finally, does anybody use it as an opportunity to uh, voice a, a concern they have or something they'd like to see? Are you hearing anything in those? Always. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the other day, my husband and I were on a bike ride. Someone flagged me down and uh, was worried about beach crowding, asked me to ride my bike to that beach to get them to, Tell them to knock, knock it knock off. This. People ask me that all the time. Uh, the other day we were out for a walk and there was a crowd at a local bar. Governor, Governor, can you please go in there and get them to knock it off? Oh yeah, I hear it all the time. Well, Governor, thank you for your time. Thank you. A quick note, the stateroom was not air conditioned, so those were large fans that you heard in the background. I want to thank you for watching my interview with Governor Raimondo. If you missed any of it, it's on WPRI.com, and you can take us with you as a podcast. Subscribe through iTunes. I'm Tim White. We'll see you next week on Newsmakers.